Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless adul adultery. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's pray and ask God to help us to understand his word. Let's pray together. Father, we do pray that in our changing world and the changing culture in which we live, that we as Christians may always be gracious, but that we may always be willing to stand up for the truth. So we pray that you will help us to speak the truth in love, and you will give us backbone, and you will give us strong stomachs to stand up for what we believe. So will you help us, we pray, and we do pray your special hand upon our school. We thank you for your blessing upon it over these 21 years. We pray for David, our principal, and for the management committee, and your special, special hand upon them. Uh, give them wisdom as they lead and manage our school. And now, Lord, will you open your word to us? Will you open our hearts that we may hear the word of God as we read the Bible? Let's pray. Let's, and we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. In November last year, I had a week in the uh, UK and uh, not sure if it was BBC Two or BBC Four, but at 6.25 a.m., uh, there was every day a thought for the day. And um, uh, some of it was good, some of it was rubbish, um, but it was kind of otherworldly. So, you, you, so it started with some sacred music, and then someone talked in a kind of a religious voice, whatever that is, and then it ended with this sacred music. And then you got to 6.30, the 6.30 news. It's bright and breezy. You get back, to the, get back to the real world as if the religious world is another world or an unreal world. Yet chapter 4 of 1 Peter, and this is written by the Apostle Peter who was with Jesus, one of the 12, is not a religious world. It's not an unreal world. It's actually the real world because it deals with real questions and it gives us real answers. I think the key verse must be verse two. Have a look at verse two, where Peter writes and says, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, that means our lives, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So the chapter is really dealing with the question, how do we live for the will of God while we have breath? while we are alive, while we are in the flesh. What does it mean to live for God now in the real world? So let's unpack this passage. I'm going to do so under three headings. Let me give them to you so that you know where we're going. Three headings to help us understand this passage. First of all, living God's way requires a decisive change of lifestyle. Secondly, living God's way requires a decisive change in thinking. And thirdly, living God's way requires a decisive change of ambitions. So let's dig in straight away. Living God's way requires a decisive change of lifestyle. Now, it's quite obvious, if you remember from Leah's reading, that there are two ways of life in this passage. There are two patterns of life. 
The one way we saw in verse 3, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Well, I mean, that's not strange to our ears. That's, that's a normal lifestyle of, of non-Christians, isn't it? Heavy drinking, sexual promiscuity, orgies, pornography, it's disorder, it's destructive. Well, that was the pagan lifestyle in first century Turkey, to whom Peter was writing, the churches in Turkey. But it's also pretty much the pagan non-Christian lifestyle in 21st century Joburg. And of course, some of you have been there. In fact, it's our natural human nature to practice verse 3. Verse 3 comes to us naturally. Let's party, let's have some fun, everyone's doing it. Go on, have another drink. So chapter 4 is really talking about the real world. And some of you may remember those days with great shame and great remorse. And you would hate your kids to know what you did when you were 19 or when you were 29. Some of you may still be there. Some of you may be most ashamed if we were to know what you did last night or Friday night. So Peter is really just describing the real world, real Johannesburg. Notice those two last words in verse 3. He talks about, he talks about lawless idolatry. Now, I think that could well have been the headline this week when those two Metro police officers were killed at a roadblock when a drunken driver, six times over the limit, plunged into them in his BMW. You see, drinking can be an idol. And when you're drunk, it becomes lawlessness. Let's be honest, my friends. Heavy drinking in our society is a huge, huge problem. Where binge drinking and wild weekend parties have become the norm. And for many people, that's the idol. That's what they live for. They live for the weekend. So here we have lawless idolatry, especially when you are six times over the limit and you can't see the roadblock. Perhaps there's someone listening on the website or perhaps someone here this morning who would associate with that as I speak, because you may still be bubbleless from last night or Friday night. Verse 3, notice verse 3a, notice what Peter says, for the time that is past suffices. So Peter's pretty blunt, it's been long enough. Isn't it time to grow up? Have you spent enough time in your self-indulgence? How many more weekends are you going to waste? That, that's really what he's saying in verse 3, 3a. And Peter's saying, you don't actually have to live like that. It's not the only alternative. No, there's another way. There's another lifestyle which he then describes in verse 7. Let me read from verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So you'll notice there, verse 7, instead of self-indulgence, there's self-control. Notice verse 8, instead of lust, there's love. Notice verse 8, homes are used for hospitality, not for orgies. Verse 10, instead of exploiting people, their money, their bodies... No, we serve people. You see, it's very important for us to understand human nature, and particularly our own human nature. John Calvin, who gets a very bad press, though he massively influenced the Reformation and massively influenced what we teach and preach in this church and what we believe. John Calvin, in his Institutes, so he wrote Institutes, they're two volumes, and he wrote a number of commentaries, on most of the books of the Bible. But in his Institutes, on page one, in the introduction, John Calvin very wisely says, there are two things you must know. You must know two things. Number one, you must know God. And number two, you must know yourself. 
So you need to know that our human nature, your human nature, my human nature from birth is fallen. It is sinful. We are born in sin. Sin is our mother. It's the breath we breathe. So the lifestyle of verse 3 actually comes to us naturally. It's our default position when we're not on best behavior. Now, you may not go to wild drinking parties and orgies, but you may do it in a much more sophisticated, civilized way. But sin comes to us naturally, doesn't it? I mean, I don't find it difficult to sin. I don't need self-control or self-discipline to sin. No, it's like falling off a log. It's easy, because that is my natural human nature. However, verse 7, when he talks about self-control, sober-mindedness, prayers, I mean, those are in many ways unnatural to us. We don't find those things easy. They don't come naturally to us. They are supernatural, which is why in chapter 1, verse 3, he talks about being born again. Your old nature is verse 3. You need a new nature. You need to be born again. You need chapter 4, verse 6. You need the Spirit of God within you, living within you. So we can't do it on our own. It is supernatural. In fact, it's so, it's so unnatural in our world that this behavior from verse 7 to 10 seems very strange to our non-Christian family and friends, doesn't it? You see that in verse 4. Your old castle lager Johnny Walker buddies, what do they do? They laugh at you. They dismiss you because you won't join them. Verse 4, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. Some of you have told me that, that, um, that you've been Christians for 10 years and your Christian family still thinks that you'll get over this religious phase. And in the meantime, they have no problems dissing you, maligning you, uh, laughing at you at a braai or a Christmas lunch because of your Christian beliefs. And Peter says, well, that's how it is. They are surprised that you are, not lo that you are no longer going with them to the parties and getting totally, uh, um, totally wasted. Well, Peter's quite blunt, isn't he? You cannot live in the will of God, verse 2, if you are still mixing with that old crowd. I'm not saying we do not need to try and influence that old crowd, but you are no longer a member of the old crowd. You just don't belong. You can't do the will of God if you're living with people who have no intention but to live for the will of man. I mean, it's obvious. So you cannot say that you're a Christian. You cannot say that you are born again if there's been no decisive change in your lifestyle. It's a contradiction in terms. You're either one or the other. A peach tree will always bear peaches. It won't bear mangoes or pawpaws. As Jesus says, you shall know them by their fruit. A decisive change in your lifestyle. Well, let's have a look at the second prin principle in living God's way. Living God's way requires a decisive change of thinking. Now, you cannot make sense of life if you are not sure where you come from or where you are going. And that's certainly the plight of the Western world in the 21st century, if not elsewhere. And if you don't know where you come from or where you're going, it results ultimately in meaningless, meaninglessness and pointlessness. It results in despair, in existential angst. Remember Woody Allen, who talked about the stupefying fear of death, which gives us no reason or meaning or purpose in living. I wonder if there's not something behind that. Uh, we have all remembered the past week or two, Bra Yu, and many, many years ago, he had a trumpet solo called The Joke of Life. Now, they aren't words, but it's a very haunting solo. And you wonder if behind that is not a sense of meaninglessness. Now the, now, the devil has been extremely cunning by cutting off our roots, cutting off our history, and cutting off our future. 
So he's managed to persuade, to persuade almost every school child that there's no creator and no creation. I have no beginning, no origin, no one made me. And then he's also managed to, to persuade almost every school child that there's no end, there's no judgment, there's no accountability. There's no life after death. Well, of course, my dear friends, if there's no beginning and no end, if there's no creator at the beginning, if there's no judge at the end, what is life all about? We're lost in the middle. If we, if we have no beginning and we have no end, it's rather pointless, isn't it? Might as well, verse 3, live in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. You see, you see how successful the devil has actually been. Imagine if, if you were traveling in a vast uh, spaceship. Uh, let's call it Starship Enterprise. And uh, you've been traveling in Starship now for 50 years. And uh, you turn to one of your colleagues in space and you say, excuse me, but could you kindly tell me where we started? And your colleague has no answer. In fact, no one has an answer. In fact, they think it's a dumb question. And then after another 20 years, you turn to another colleague in space and you say, well, excuse me, but could you t kindly tell me where we're going? Well, no one knows. There's no answer. In fact, it's a stupid question. Well, what to do? If we don't know where we started, if we don't know where we're going, well, all we can do is make the best of the spaceship. Wine tasting, cycling in the gym, aerobics, Netflix. Well, you've got to live for something, otherwise you'll go mad. So you live for what's around you. In this corner, it's literature, the book of the month. In this corner, it's art and music. Most popular is The Naked Chef, uh, where, where you get food. My dear friends, if there's no beginning and no end in the real world, it is meaningless. It's quite absurd. It's pointless. Might as well go back to verse 3. Well, Peter brings us to the real world, not the 6.25 a.m. world, but the 6.30 a.m. world, the news, the real world of today, and he gives us some fixed points for living. In fact, he gives us two fixed points which give us ultimate reality. The first fixed point is there in verse 1. Peter looks back at the cross. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh... So Christ died to free me from my old way of life and my old waste of life. My dear friends, it is a waste of life. If you're only living for yourself and your own needs and your own rights and your own comfort and your own happiness, how pathetic that is. I mean, is that your purpose? Is that why you're here? Is that really what it's all about? So he looks back at the cross says Christ died to free us from that empty way of life. And then he looks forward, verse 7, to the judgment of Christ. It's almost like two book ends. He looks forward to the judgment of Christ. The end of all things is at hand. And because of that, you are to be self-controlled. You are to be sober-minded. You are to stop living with that old crowd. So, so unlike our godless world, which has no idea where they're coming from or where they're going... And life is obviously pointless. It has to be pointless. Peter gives us some fixed points in the real world. He looks back at the cross, which freed us from that self sinful, self-indulgent life, a waste of a life. And he looks forward to the return of Christ, the final judgment, when we will see Christ face to face. See, our world doesn't think. Our world distracts itself on Starship Enterprise. Well, they look at the menu of the Starship, the furniture, the social media, the Premier League. Well, you've got to do something. In fact, our world doesn't want to think. Because when you turn off all the distractions, and there are many, and they're increasing every day. When you turn off all the distractions, you are stuck with yourself. And you actually start asking the questions, who am I, why am I here, where do I come from, and where am I going? 
So far better to turn up the volume and look out for, look out for, for, for the next game because we don't want to think. That's why I think Christian preachers need to stop talking about this week or today or our present needs. No, we need to be reminded of, of the reality of the real world. Peter's two fixed points which decide everything. The cross and the judgment, our past and our future. And my dear friends, no one wants to remind us of that. No one. You will find it nowhere else except in the Christian church and in the Bible. Because no one else will talk about it. It is too painful. Christ suffered in the past to rescue me from sin and pointlessness. In the future, there is judgment and there's accountability as to what we've done with our lives, our time, our talents. So unlike spaceship enterprise, God thinks this life matters. Spaceship enterprise doesn't think your life matters. God believes your life matters, your decisions matter, how you live, how you behave. It matters. How did you spend it? Because God will hold us accountable. And because he holds us accountable, it means that he, that he thinks our lives matter. So does your present life, your lifestyle, your behavior, spending of your time, your money, your talents, does it does it fit in with those two fixed points? Because if it doesn't, something's not quite right. There's a sense of dysfunctionality. That's why the reason you and I need to read our Bible every day, the reason we need to come to church every Sunday, the reason we need to go to a, to a life group in the midweek is because we backslide so easily. We forget those things so easily. We're taken up by the things of this world which are temporary. And we forget the true realities. Well, let's have a look at our last principle. First principle, living God's way requires a decisive change of lifestyle. Secondly, requires a decisive change of thinking. And thirdly, living God's way requires a decisive change of ambitions. Let's have a look again, verse 7. Let me read that again. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as, God's, as good stewards of God's varied grace. So notice again verse 7, instead of being self-indulgent, no, we are self-controlled. Verse 8, instead of using people, no, we love people, we forgive people. Verse 9, instead of locking down your house for selfish privacy, you're actually opening your home for hospitality, perhaps hosting a life group. Some of our staff, some of our church members, it's a lovely thing that's starting to happen, are having a weekly dinner at their home to invite other people from the church family. And um, you don't have to worry about cleaning up the house. You don't have to worry about making some fancy foods. Sp sp spaghetti bolognese is fine. It's just meeting together. It's building family. It's loving one another. It's serving one another. So a good question is, how do you use your home for the gospel? Perhaps another good question is, in how do you use your car for the gospel? These are the precious things that we, that we won't admit. So, so we have a lovely practice here at church with the staff. I don't think it's a rule, but it's just a practice, that if any one of our staff, especially the younger staff, don't have cars, that we say to them, if you need a car, just ask me. So uh, Panganai, who, who, who doesn't have a car, I've said to him, if, if you need it during the day or perhaps the evening or the weekend, you can use it. Are you taking notes, Panganai? Yes. <laughs> and then I'll just borrow Helen's car, and she's on her own. So, <laughs> but I mean, it at, so it's an attitude. This home isn't my home. This car isn't my car. It's God's car. How can I use it for the gospel? I think verse 10 is really the crescent, the high point of the passage. Everything leads up to verse 10. The key is verse 2, but I think the crescent is verse 10. 
So let me read that again. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So if in the past Christ suffered to free you from your sin, from your pointless life, if in the future God will hold you accountable for how you've spent your life, your time, your talents, your money, then verse 10, whatever gift or talent or ability God has given you, use it to serve the family. Use it to serve the gospel. Use it to serve eternity. I mean, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? You see, because you've been bought by the blood of Christ, you are no longer your own. Perhaps you didn't know that, but you are no longer your own. You don't own yourself at all. You belong to Christ. You no longer own anything, by the way. You're a steward of God's gifts. We don't own anything, my friends. We are stewards of God's gifts and graces that he's given us. So verse 11, if God gave you the gift of speaking, then speak on behalf of God. I was asked to speak at a funeral, and uh, they said, but please don't mention God. So I said, well, I can't do that. And then to add insult to injury, they said, we'll pay you. I said, um, <laughs> I said there's, lots of, there's lots of MCs out there. You can go and pay them but there's no ways I can speak without sharing the gospel. If you have the gift of serving, verse 11, then serve, serve for the glory of God, not the glory of self. If God has given you the gift of music, we have such wonderful uh, musicians who lead us in our praise and worship of God, well then use your gift to bring glory to God, not glory to self. If you have the gift of making money, then surely you ought to use that gift, that money, to grow the kingdom of God. I mean, that should be our attitude. Naked you come and naked you leave. And it's not a pretty sight for many of us. But that's how it is. We don't own anything. We are stewards. We are trustees of our lives, our time, our talents, our gifts, our money to serve God. Now, you can all see that I don't have too many years left. That's quite obvious. Uh, but I have no, no, no plans to retire from ministry. So I will have to retire at some point in time as the rector of Christ Church Midrand because you don't want a dinosaur as the, your rector. <laughs> but I won't retire from Christian ministry because God has given me gifts for which I'm thankful. He's given me time. So I will find a church that can't afford a minister and say, I will come and serve you. And then when I'm finally getting older and older, and we're in an old age home, well, I'm going to start some Bible studies in the old age home. And I'll shuffle to the Bible study, <laughs> try and read the Bible. Why? Because my life, my time, everything belongs to God. I mean, what else do you want to spend your money on? What else do you want to spend your time on? You need to know that one of, my, one of my prayers, and it's an honest prayer, you may smile at it, but one of my honest prayers is that God will give us 100 million rand to grow the kingdom. That's my prayer. I have a few years left, and hopefully we can use that money to grow God's kingdom. And I've told God I'm not going to spend a cent on myself, and I've also told God that I do think that... that, um, that um, that I probably can spend that 100 million rand better than most people on the kingdom. You have no ideas how many plans I have. We want to grow Explore in all the Southern African countries. We want to grow our church plants in Zimbabwe, in the DRC, in Mozambique. We want to... Um, we want to grow the Gospel Coalition Africa. As I mentioned last week, uh, they had 750,000 hits from Africa on the website. We've been given that website. So what a wonderful opportunity. That's the, that's the start of our market, to share good evangelical reform theology. Uh, we want to train and pay for, pay for young men and women to go to George Woodfield College so that they can become leaders and church planters and evangelists. We want to, uh, we, need, we need 10 million rand, just by the way, uh, 
to, to finish the admin block. It's phase one. We still need to complete it with some offices and a chapel. We need to also, with that money, renovate this building and the small hall and especially the toilets. Um, I would like us to have an endowment fund for Nokopila School so that it becomes sustainable. Now, don't feel that you left out if you have 200 million rand. <laughs> because I could go on. You see, if Peter's two fixed points are true, if that is the real world, then surely our privilege and our duty is to live for God in every possible way, wherever God has placed us. He's given us different talents. That's what, he, that's what we are told in verse 10, verse 11. We have different talents, different opportunities, uh, different gifts. But all of us are to use those, not for ourselves, obviously not. What's the point? No, we use them for God, for his kingdom. I'm well aware, my dear friends, that I will be forgotten like you will. We will be forgotten. No one will remember us. Twenty years after I'm dead, there will be no remembrance of Martin Morrison. There won't even be tax record records anymore. That's true for all of us. Only what will last is God's word, God's truth. That is what will last for all eternity. So we're only stewards. We're only trustees. And when we appear before God on Judgment Day, he will hold us accountable, both you and me, as to how we have used the gifts, the talents, the time, the lives that he's given us for him and for his kingdom. So the question is, what does that mean for you? And what action do you need to take? Well, let's pray. Father, once again, as we sit under the authority of your word, we are so mindful that so often we are sucked in by our culture. And Lord, for all of us, myself included, there are times when we only think of ourselves. And so, Lord, will you help us to repent? And will you help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on those two great fixed points in the real world? The death of Christ and the return of Christ, the judgment day. And so will you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, without your Spirit, we lost, we're hopeless. Fill us with your Spirit that we may live for Christ at home, in our marriages, in our families, at work, in the office, on the sports field, wherever you place us. Help us to live for Christ. And that on that great day, you may well say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. So, Father, work amongst us. We can't do these things ourselves. You know our sinful hearts. You know our mixed motives. We pray, Lord, that you will overrule those things so that our lives may count for eternity. Now, go with us into this week, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen.